And it's you I will follow into the light, into the light. It's you I will follow into the light, into the light. It's you I will follow into the light, into the light. City Church downtown. Oh, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Me too. How about that? So I'm going to ask y'all, of course, if y'all are over here, can you scoot over that way? We got a lot of people coming that way or that way and they'll say like that middle. I'm sure you understood me. Thank you. Now, if you could turn to somebody and give them a holy high five or a holy fist bump. Excellent. Yeah, 
Well, good morning. How are you rowdy people doing on this fine Sunday morning? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't mind, go ahead and take a seat just for a minute, and we're about to dedicate some children and some parents to the Lord. And as we do that, we need to acknowledge something up front that, one, is that children don't always stay still for adult ceremonies and the like, right? But we just say here, that's okay. We're just glad that our children are in church, and if they wiggle or carry on or whatever, we're all good with that. We just think that that's their form of worship, right? And we got lots of babies happening in our church. You know what causes that, right? Okay, so um, um, we're glad and we're thankful for uh, all that's happening in our church and all these wonderful babies that are going to be dedicated today. Now, I want to introduce to you Michelle Cook, who's our uh, Kid City director. Hold up just for a second here. She's a little rock star around here, I'm telling you. Um, but Michelle is going to introduce the parents and their children, and then the parents and children are going to come and line up against the front. Uh, so as Michelle comes, would you guys give a rowdy City Church welcome for Kid City Director Michelle Cook? There you go. Thank you. So, <laughs> so um, it's quite an honor to be able to introduce... Um, all your the families and a lot of the kids that I have the privilege to serve upstairs. So thank you. Okay, so first off, we have Layla Rolf, dedicated by parents Janessa and Landon. <laughs> Next, we have Zarina and Dustin Blue, dedicated by parents Anseta and Justin. Cameron Shelton, dedicated by mom, Jasmine Jackson. <laughs> Gavin, Sarah, and Jake Lawrence, dedicated by parents, Eric and Laura. <laughs> Christian and Luke Palau, dedicated by parents, Vanessa and Junior. Brian Rios, dedicated by mom and dad, Felicia and Brian. Camila and Chris Cavazos, dedicated by parents, Viviana and Chris. Antonio, Anaya, and Miguel Rivas, dedicated by parents, Brenda and Miguel. Serenity Grace Lopez, dedicated by parents Trino and Lisa. <laughs> Sofia Sanchez, dedicated by dad John Sanchez. <laughs> Nathaniel and James Juarez, dedicated by grandparents Carol and Jean. Abraham Gallardo, dedicated by parents Raquel and Mike. And Abigail Morales, dedicated by parents Clarissa and Jose. Well, thank you, Michelle. And parents, as you seek to train your children, I want to ask you to consider these words from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. You'll see the verses on the screen where the Bible tells us you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Now, look, look at this next part, parents. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. So, parents, today... I challenge and encourage you to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to creatively and repeatedly teach these things to your children. And as your children see the love of God in your life, see the authenticity of a relationship with Jesus Christ in your life, they will want what you have. So parents, by coming before God and his people in the church today, do you hereby declare yourselves and your desire to dedicate not only yourself, but also your child to the Lord? And do you commit to partner with this local church to provide your child a God-honoring home? And do you commit to encourage your child to one day 
begin a love relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do that, parents, just say, we do. Very good. We also have godparents among us today. If you're a godparent uh, of one of the children here at the front, I want to ask you to stand up now, and I want to give a charge to you as well. Um, Some godparents are here in the back. Um, Others are around. Here's the challenge to godparents. If anything should happen to these parents, heaven forbid, you're called upon to raise this child. Children, do you commit to love this child like one of your own? And raise the child up in the ways of Jesus Christ. If you do that, godparents, just say, we do. Very good. And finally, I want to challenge the church, all of us, because no doubt some of you have heard that old adage, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes like two villages to raise my children. (laughs) That's okay, some (laughs) preacher's kids, you know. But uh, parents need the help and support of friends and neighbors, right? And so that's what we do as we partner with them to encourage their children in the ways of God. So do you commit to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ to help these parents standing before you to train their children in the ways of God so that these children might one day have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ? If you accept this responsibility, church, just respond by saying, we do. Very good. Let's say a word of prayer over these families. God, I want to thank you for... These moms, these dads, we love them and thank you for them. And I pray for a special blessing on their lives. I pray for protection over their families. I pray protection over these special little ones as uh, they stand here before the body of Christ. I know that uh, there are demonic forces active in our world trying to divide, divide families, divide children from their parents. And I pray that these children would be protected by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that they would be raised in such a way where they would come to know you. So protect their hearts, minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. That they would grow up in wisdom and favor and stature with both God and man. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Everybody said, amen. 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 Parents, you can uh, get your kids checked in or have a seat. Thank you.
clap our hands to charge the atmosphere with praise. And we speak these truths and we sing these truths together as one. As one. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? stop us and if our God is with us who could stand against and if our God is for us who could ever stop us and if our God is with us who could stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us? and if our God is with us then what could stand against and if our God is for us who could ever stop us if our God here and we long for you. I'm going to ask God to put your hand over your heart and with the other hand reach up. Lord, you know this heart. You know exactly what it needs. You know how it hurts. You know how it's been broken. And I know that you can put it back together. You can make it brand new. Heavenly Father, wherever we are in our journey, we ask that your presence surround us and our hearts. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. And everyone who agrees will say, amen. amen. Y'all can have a seat. Welcome to Sunday Announcements. I am Sandrine and I am here in our video cafe. For some of you, the video cafe is just a place to grab coffee and a snack, but what some of you may not know is that the video cafe is also a place to hang out during service. We stream the services live into the cafe, so if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you, grab a coffee, sit down, you've got place to take notes, have conversation about what's being spoken about from the stage. Just check it out, give it a try. 
baptisms. I've been talking about baptisms. Those are coming up Sunday, September 15th. You can sign up for baptisms in the lobby after service. There's someone there that can answer any questions you have regarding baptism. City Youth is back this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. in the cafe right here in this room that I'm at right now. Middle school, high school students, join us. Fun times, pizza, getting into the word, having good conversation, group time. You want to check it out. If you want more information, you can also visit the lobby, and I've got some information out there for you. Well, recovery classes are starting once again in September. If you are interested in being a part of these groups, you can sign up in the lobby after service, and the leaders of those groups will be in touch with you, get you all informed, and get you connected into a group. We had a lot of kids dedicated today at Child Dedication, and for that, we are so excited. So parents, if you have children that were dedicated or you are a first-time visitor, we have Kid City volunteers available in the lobby and just outside of the cafe to help get your kids checked in and get them into Kid City. They don't want to miss out on a good time that's going on up there. Okay. I think that's it. If this is your first time to City Church downtown, I want to give you an extra special welcome. We are so glad to have you. Everyone else, I'll see you next week. Well, it's great to be with you guys this week as we start our Red Thread series. I also want to welcome those of you that are watching online and next door at the Video Cafe. And as I was thinking about the topic and the Red Thread of Redemption that stretches throughout the whole Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, I couldn't help but think about a visit to New York City a few years ago when my wife and I were walking by the September 11th Memorial. And as I, we walked by there, you could feel the reverence in the air amongst New Yorkers who were passing by. It's like that sight was a reverent sight because New Yorkers understand that it's important that we remember and honor both victims and firefighters who sacrifice their lives in order to save the lives of others. And then on a family vacation in recent years, we went to Washington, D.C., and while we were there, uh, we went to the tomb of the unknown soldier. How many of you have been there, by the way, at Arlington National Cemetery? A bunch of us, right? And so you know what it feels like when you watch the changing of the guard. I mean, every move, every pause, every motion is carefully planned out because we understand that it's important to remember and honor soldiers who have given their lives so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. And we all know that just a stone's throw from here, just a couple of blocks over is what? The Alamo, right? Some of you are like, hey, a hotel. No, the Alamo, okay? <laughs> the Alamo is a big deal. The Battle of the Alamo was the pivotal event in the Texas Revolution because we know that it's important for us to remember that you don't mess with Texas, Jack, okay? Isn't that what that's about, right? And ask Ozzy Osbourne about that, okay? And if, if you jack around over at the Alamo, the Daughters of the Republic, you know what they'll do, right? They'll tase you or something. And I uh, sometimes meet people from out of town, and you look at the Alamo, and you think, man, you know, it's, what's the big deal? I mean, architecturally, it's not all that impressive next to skyscrapers and the like. Well, if you think the Alamo is about architecture, you don't get it. What the Alamo is about was sacrifice, right? There was a room over there. If you go over there today, there was a room where women and children were huddling, scared for their lives, not knowing if they would make it. A few of them were able to make it out. But most of you know that 200 Texans and Tejanos died there. Why? So that today, you and I can enjoy San Antonio and the Riverwalk and Fiesta and Nyosa and the Rodeo and Oyster Bake and the Spurs because 200 people gave their lives as a sacrifice. And that's why we remember the Alamo here in San Antonio. Well, there was a sacrifice that was made many years ago so that we could remember our redemption. And that's our big idea for this 
day as we study the scriptures is we want to remember our redemption, remember your redemption. When I'm spiritually discouraged, you know what's helpful for me to remember is what my life used to be like. I remember the times that weren't going so well for me. I remember the times where I didn't have God in my life and it encourages me. When I'm sitting down and talking with some of you that are newer or younger Christ followers and uh, you're not happy with where you're at spiritually at a given time, I sometimes remind you, hey, do you remember how jacked up your life was just a few years ago? Right? It's encouraging because some of you, your lives were falling apart. Remember your redemption. Now, uh, this was the charge to remember redemption from God to the Jewish people And that's why they celebrate a holiday called Passover. And what I want to do today is I'm going to tell you the Passover story. We're going to explore the Passover story. We're going to experience part of the Passover meal. But what I want you to see today is this intersection between the Passover story and your story. So look for that intersection as I'm talking to you today. Now, uh, this story is in Exodus chapter 12, and I want to take you to 12, 14. And it says, this is a day to do what? Remember, each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival of the Lord. This is a law for all time. So I want to tell you the Cliff Notes version of the Passover story. And as I tell you the story, I want you to do something with me. Take your arm out and grab your arm right here and hold on to your arm. Like, don't make your hand turn blue or whatever, but just kind of hang on to it as I tell the story. And as I get to the end of the story, I'll tell you to let go and we'll all let go of our arms, okay? But the Passover story is about this guy named Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, maybe you've heard of the Pharaohs, right? Seen them in a museum, seen a mummy or whatever like that, okay? The Pharaoh loved keeping the Jewish people in slavery so that they could build buildings for him and monuments to him. And so he held on to them in control. But those of you that have read through the Bible in the Old Testament or perhaps seen the Prince of Egypt movie or something like that, or, you know, Yule Brenner in the Ten Commandments, you know the story that uh, God sent his servant Moses to go to the Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But Pharaoh held on, didn't he? God is a patient God. God doesn't want to judge anyone. God gives us opportunities, and God gave Pharaoh an opportunity to let his people go, but Pharaoh hardened his heart to God. So God had to bring plagues on Pharaoh to encourage him and convince him to let his people go. You still holding those arms? If you're not holding your arm, The fleas of a million camels may nest on your armpits right here. So just be careful about this, right? But So God sent a plague on Pharaoh, the plague of blood in the water. I imagine that was pretty nasty, right? Um, um, Blood in the water, but Pharaoh still hardened his heart and wouldn't let go of the people of God. He kept holding on, and then God sent more plagues, right? The frogs. Frogs were in everything. Frogs were in your house and uh, all over the place, in your room, under your bed, in your closet. Uh, But Pharaoh still hardened his heart, but God is patient and didn't judge him immediately. But God brought another plague of the gnats and flies. Can you imagine? Gnats and flies are into everything, all up in your business and driving you crazy. But Pharaoh still would not let go. He held on control of the Jewish people. And so more plagues came, the plague of pestilence. And then there were boils that came on people. And then there was hail coming from the sky, damaging the crops. And then there were locusts that came and ate the remainder of the crops. And so they had nothing left. Pharaoh continued to harden his heart. And then there was a plague of darkness. God was patient and gave Pharaoh all these opportunities. But what did he do? He hardened his heart and he wouldn't let go. And you know what happens? God's patience will run out. And God finally had to bring a plague that would force Pharaoh to let go. You may let go of your arm now. So Passover is the day that Jewish people celebrate that Pharaoh let go and God delivered them. So in the little plastic bag that you got when you came in, you got this little container of water. I want you to pull that out. That's actually salt water, and this is one of the elements of a Passover Seder meal that Jewish people have on their plate at the Passover meal, and here's what it symbolizes. The tears shed as a result of slavery. Here in just a minute, I'm going to give you opportunity to come and kneel at the front and pray or 
pray in your seat. So hang on to this until that time. But when you start to pray, whether it's in your seat or kneeling at the front as one of us comes by to put a hand on your shoulder and pray for you, I want you to remember the tears of spiritual slavery. Some of you remember what your life was like before God came into your life and changed you and lifted you up and helped you. The tears of slavery. I remember seasons of my life where my immorality affected not only my career but also my marriage. And I remember many a night just crying before God because of the mess that I've made of my life. Others of you wish you had never started abusing that substance or looking at those images on the screen because now it's an addiction and you sometimes in your heart cry because you wish you weren't in slavery or bondage. Others of you have come out of those addictions and you can remember those days of the tears of slavery. And so I want to say a brief prayer over us and then I want you to come and kneel or pray at your seat. And as you do, just put your finger on this and touch it to your mouth to remember the tears of slavery. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that as the tears come and as we remember the tears that it would be healing to our souls, God. So as we come and kneel and humble ourselves before you, whether in seats or up at the front, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd remember, help us to remember that time so that we can honor you for what you've done in our lives. Amen. Well, I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? Goes like this to fourth to fifth. We might have fallen, the major lift. The baffled king composing hallelujah. 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 Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof, her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to the kitchen chair. She broke your throne and she cut your hair. From your lips you drew. Shoot somebody who outdrew you. It's not a cry that you hear at night. It's not somebody who's seen the light. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. 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 As you remember the seasons of tears in your life, perhaps you're in it right now. I want to give you these words of encouragement from the Bible that God saves every one of your tears in a bottle because you're that important to him. And so may those tears be healing to your soul 
as we continue to look at the Passover meal. Another element you're going to find in your bag is a little piece of bread. This represents the matzah bread. This is found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 39, which says, For bread they baked flat cakes from the dough without yeast they had from Egypt. It was made without yeast because the people were driven out of Egypt in such a hurry. They had no time to prepare the bread or other food. And what this bread represents in the Passover meal is the hurry to escape the control from Moses. Moses, uh, or rather, uh, uh, Pharaoh kept the control. And when Moses came and warned him, finally God forced uh, Pharaoh to let go. The people had to go while they had this window of opportunity. And some of you have lived in ways that are apart from God or lived in sin or addiction or things that are damaging your life and you get an opportunity where you're motivated to do something about it. It's time to step through that window of opportunity. For some, it's time to go to the, the table in the lobby today and say, you know, I want to sign up for a step study or a small group where I can help get help getting out of this addiction or this struggle. For those of you, you came, you know, you've been coming for a little while and you've been hearing the message of the gospel and it's like God's drawing you to himself. And while you have a window of opportunity, step through it. Now, I'm not typically uh, the type of person that rushes people to begin a relationship with God, you know? Because I know sometimes it takes time and you have to read and kind of think through it and all of that. And we've all, or a lot of us have been in these churches before where you felt like the pastor was like a timeshare salesman, right? And trying to really force you and pressure you into some kind of decision that you're not ready to make. And so certainly I say, carefully think through. But at the same time, if you have this window of opportunity, when the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you into relationship with God, you have to take advantage of that opportunity. The Bible tells us that our lives are like a vapor, that they just disappear. It also says in one place that today is the day of salvation. You don't really know what a day brings forth, man. Anything can happen. And I've been to four different funerals in recent days, and in all of them, it was people dying before their time, people who did not expect to die and leave this earth, people that had a lot of life ahead of them. And I want all of you to be prepared to meet God. So take advantage of the window of opportunity that he gives you today. Now, one of the primary symbols of the Passover meal is a lamb's shank bone, and I'll show you a picture of that on the screen. Uh, this represents God's outstretched arm of help in Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. It says, they are to take some of the blood, a blood from a lamb, and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. So next picture is going to be a picture of a Passover door where there's blood over the top of the door and on the frames. Now, you got to understand this about the days of the Bible. They didn't have H-E-B, right? where someone did the dirty work of butchering their meat. People had to butcher their own meat in those days. And for the Passover meal, God instructed them to take the blood of the lamb that you butcher and take a hyssop plant and paint over the door. And here's why. Look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. It says, on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt, and I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord, but the blood on your door, doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you're staying. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and this plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the blood on the Passover door is the red thread of redemption in our story today. If you think about this plague of the death of the firstborn. This is what God had to do to get Pharaoh's attention, to get him to let go. This didn't happen on the spur of the moment. This wasn't God just losing control one day. Pharaoh had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And God says, if I pass over and see the blood over your doorpost, you're covered and nothing will happen to your firstborn. You remember just moments ago, there were parents standing right up here, holding their children, some of them holding their firstborn child. Can you imagine the relief if you knew there was a way 
for your firstborn child to be saved. This was what Passover was. God had given them away so that their children could be saved and they could escape Egypt and worship God freely. Now, a final Passover meal element designed to help us to remember the day that Pharaoh let go are what's called the four cups. For the sake of time today, we're only going to focus on one of those cups, and that is the third cup in the Passover meal. And here's what it symbolizes or represents. It represents the cup of God's judgment poured out. And this is the same cup that Jesus is referring to when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he would be crucified. Remember, Jesus prayed, oh, Father, please let this cup pass from me. If there's any way, please let this cup pass from me because Jesus knew that what that cup represented was the judgment of God coming. And Jesus knew that what that meant for him is that he would be God's Passover lamb and that God's judgment would come upon him so that we could today be free of the judgment of God that we deserve. Now, I understand all this talk of blood seems barbaric to some. And you may be asking, well, what does this ancient Jewish narrative have to do with me in 2013? Well, here's what it has to do with you. It is a picture of something that affects your eternity and mine even today. It's kind of like this. Maybe you've wondered... Why God God can't just say, hey, let's just sweep sins under the rug. You know, we all know that there's evil in the world and that there's sin out there, right? And people do bad things that hurt other people. Well, why can't God just blow it off, right? If God is God and he's all powerful, he could just say, let it be blown off and I'll wave my magic blow off like, you know, uh, fairy wand or whatever and say all is forgiven. But God can't do that because his character is just, and every sin must be paid for. You know, uh, we put murderers in prison in our society, don't we? Why do we do that? Because family of the victim who was murdered, they want justice, but even if they don't want the criminal to face the death penalty or to go to prison, they, they at least want to take the person who murders out of the society so that others aren't victimized, right? And so the society pays for the murder, whether through the penal system or through losing more people in the society. And so uh, I know that most of us probably have not murdered, right? But our sins of omission, sins of omission are things, good things that we should have done that we didn't do, They have a butterfly effect on the whole world and our lack of generosity to the poor so that we can indulge in first world pleasures has a negative impact on the poor in countries all over the world. And that's why the world continues to suffer because of sins of commission and omission. And God will not allow this into heaven. So God had to do something about it. And ultimately, he paid for our sins with his lamb, Jesus. That is why the Bible tells us in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, he took some bread, Jesus did as he was celebrating the Passover, and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to what? Remember me. And so uh, if you would pull out your communion cup here, don't break it open yet. I just want you to hold it. Okay, hang on to it. We're going to take communion in just a minute, but hang on to it. And before we take communion, I want to tell you a story that I hope will make sense of this for you. One day, a bus driver was taking a bus full of children home. And as he did, he was on a hill, and he realized that the brakes went out on his bus, and he realized he was in a very precarious situation. And he was going down around a hill, and he had to navigate the bus um, so it wouldn't go off a cliff. And then as he went down the hill, he knew this hill very well. He knew that if he were to swerve to the left, that he would go off an embankment. On the other side was um, a sheer cliff. And at the bottom, there was a field and a fence at the bottom. And he just hoped that he could plow through that fence and into a flat field down at the bottom of this hill. 
and somehow get this bus to stop and save the lives of all the children on board. And so he went down the hill, he held on and maintained as best he could. And when he got down to the bottom of the hill, um, near the bottom where the gate was, there was a child sitting on the gate. And unfortunately, he had to plow through that gate to save the lives of all the children in the bus. That child on the fence died instantly. Rescue workers came, parents came. They thanked the bus driver for navigating the bus in such a way that their children's lives would be saved. And as rescue workers were tending to this bus driver, he was obviously in shock, and uh, parents were trying to come and thank him and talk to him. But the rescue worker said he's, he's in shock because the boy on the fence was his son. Listen, listen. This is what God did for us. It wasn't just some kid, it was his son so that you and I could have our sins paid for, so that we could enter into a relationship with God. And perhaps today this would be your first real communion. That's not just jumping through a religious hoop, but it's where you understand the sacrifice that God made for you by offering you his lamb. And so as the band sings and As we take communion in just a moment, I want you to remember your redemption, remember what it costs. But before we get to that point, I just want to say a brief prayer for some of you who have the window of opportunity right now. Today is the day of salvation for you. And for some reason, it just became crystal clear. And while you have this window, I want to ask you to go through it, through a simple prayer, just between you and God. Just say, God, Right now, the best I understand and best I know how, I believe that the lamb that died, that the son on the fence who died was Jesus for my soul. I believe that, and God, I welcome you into my life, and I thank you that I can remember this day is the day of my redemption. Thank you for what you're doing among us, God. If you just prayed that prayer and you want me to know about it, just peek up at me. Maybe just show me one hand real quick. Anybody? Right over here, yeah. Right down here, yeah. Anybody else all around here? Yeah, I see people all over the the deal here. Yeah, thank you, God, for what you're doing among us. Yeah, I see in the back, too. Yeah, I see you guys way back there. God, thank you for every hand, every heart, every soul, what you're doing among us. And so, Father, as we take communion, I pray that it would just like land on us the weight of the judgment from you that went on your only son. Just simply because you love us that much. Thank you again, God. Amen.
by the grace in his eyes. Grace is an all shot. We're all singing. Heaven meets earth like a sobby wet kiss in my heart. Turns violently inside of my chest. I Uh, I want to say to some of you who just raised your hands moments ago, thank you for including me in that special moment of your life and to be able to look on that. And I sometimes think, man, who am I to be able to look on such beautiful things as those moments when a human being comes into union with God and gets to know Him. And so it's a special thing to be a part of, and we're a blessed people to be able to watch that happen on a regular basis around here. So I think it'd be appropriate for just a minute to just thank God for that, okay? Yeah, we can do that through. You guys go ahead and take a seat for a minute. And God, the clapping was our prayer there. <laughs> and I want to just to tell you, remind you of a couple of things. In your little bag, you received a little red band. And if you'd like, go ahead and tie that around your wrist like this and make it a bracelet and wear it throughout this series so that we can remember the thread of redemption that God accomplished for us so that we could come into relationship with Him. Also, prayer leaders are going to be here at the front at the end of the service. So if you should need to pray with someone, they'd be more than happy to serve you and pray with you um, and minister to you, um, then uh, the way that we support the ministry here financially is through our worship, through giving. Now, I get if you're new to church and you, you don't buy into all this and don't believe this, we would say, hey, this service is just our gift to you, and uh, we're not expecting you to participate in the financial end of things. But those of us that are regulars here, we're so grateful for what God has done to redeem us that we give out of the overflow of our gratefulness, right? Um, some of us, our children are being dedicated here. Some of us come to relationship with Christ here. And so for us to set aside a percentage of our income regularly to support this work, you can look around and know that we're not spending a lot of money on ornate church building, right? but we're trying to be freakishly frugal in order to care for the poor and love people here in the, right in the heart of San Antonio. And uh, I know uh, that that is something that I want to be a part of. 
So practically the way that you get that done financially is there's an envelope in your seat. So if you just grab that envelope, you can fill that out, drop it in the offering box at the back. Also, you can go to the giving kiosk in the lobby if you'd like to give electronically. You can also get on your phone uh, or your pad or whatever and go to citychurchdowntown.com and click on the online giving link and give in that way. And as you give, just pray that God would use it. And personally, I just want to say thank you for the way that you guys are being generous to support the work that God is doing here in the heart of our great city. So we're grateful for you guys. If you wouldn't mind now, go ahead and stand up and join hands with the people next to you. And let me say a brief benediction over us. Dear brothers and sisters, as you walk from this place and as you look at that red band, may you, brothers and sisters, remember what it took to purchase your redemption. And as you walk throughout your week, may you walk through the windows of opportunity that God gives to you to serve him, to love others, and care for the people of this world and bring healing in the dark places of our culture. You guys are deeply loved. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks.